What's up, guys? Welcome back to The Theory Creep. I'm The Theory Creep, and this right here is the third installment of our COVID lockdown series. Now, in this video, we're going to be talking about Blanchot, who is obviously the running theme in this series, and particularly, we're going to be talking about uh, a blog post, uh, which also got turned into a monologue by uh, Fox News personality Greg Gutfield, I think is his name. Now, Gutfield's monologue or blog post is called The Prison of Two Ideas. In that two idea cell, you're either pro-immigration or a xenophobic bigot. You either love this planet or embrace evil big oil. You're either for peace or you want war. Gutpile doesn't really have the words for this, but what he's trying to say with this monologue is that Trump is a postmodernist. Trump often kind of touts himself as a builder and talks about his construction expertise, but based on what little I know about him, I have the feeling he's not actually much of a builder. He's probably more of a breaker, uh, of a demolisher, or a, of a, again, a deconstructionist. And he's basically developing a rhetorical strategy to use in partisan political debates. It's two specific strategies. The first one is one that he suggests that his conservative audience deploy, and that is a kind of centrist mock performance where you kind of pay lip service to these compromising ideas, but then stick to your insane conservative beliefs. And the idea here is to kind of make your opponent seem like the dogmatic one who's not willing to find compromise. Uh, I would say the more important strategy that he identifies uh, is really one that he says that leftists use. Um, he says, the prison of two ideas is less your choice, and he's talking to his conservative audience here, than one that is made by political adversaries who want to beat you at debate. So in a way, like I said, his thesis is a kind of rhetorical battle plan. He's trying to give his audience an approach to debating with crazy leftists. They, the leftists, trying to try to put the uh, the conservative into a cage, the prison of two ideas, and the conservative plays centrist, again, in an attempt to make them, the leftists, seem like the dogmatic ones. So, again, he wants to seem like he's taking a compromising position, like he's willing to accept a kind of back-and-forth discussion but really, again, this is just a way to seem compromising without changing any of his, frankly, like vicious political kind of conservative opinions. So what he does towards this end is he establishes straw man positions. So like the leftist will say in Gutfield's uh, perspective that, you know, you're xenophobic for wanting a wall. And it's like, hmm. Actually, the reason that the left is uncomfortable with the wall is because it's pretty transparently a way for Trump to pump money into the construction industry, which he's obviously a part of, and is probably getting some kind of kickback from, or it's going to companies that he has some ownership in. Uh, it's also not, it's like transparently not going to work. The, the border is huge. You can go over the wall, like, like even Trump. When he was pitching this, like during the campaign, he was like, you know, it's 40 feet high. You can't get over it unless maybe you have a ladder. So it's like, yeah, we all understand that this is not about stopping immigration. So it's not that the wall is xenophobic. It's that the wall is like a flagrant kind of nepotism, a kind of corporatism on behalf of Trump. Trump is xenophobic for other reasons. Gut heap is getting confused here. Trump is xenophobic, you know because of his positions on immigration, the wall notwithstanding. And this brings us to Gutfield's approach to Trump, which is why I'm making this video in the first place. I mean, if it wasn't for what he said about Trump, I would never be talking about this third-rate comic slash Aguino form. Which, if you think about it, is actually pretty impressive, right? Like, for an eel to become a third-rate comic, like, he had to master English, and he had to, you know, get an agent, and it's not an easy thing to do, is what I'm saying. 
So Gut Stench says about political leaders who use the prison of two ideas kind of approach, um, their ideas become reflexively accepted as our ideas. Through a subtle submission to authoritarian allure, we end up settling on the side of an argument because he or she says that side too. But according to Pile of Guts, this is not how Trump operates. So this is what Gutfield says about Trump. The interesting discovery with President Donald Trump is because his positions change, he happily demolishes the prison of two ideas, while, while still being a prison warden for so many others. It's brilliant, but troubling. So I'm thinking, instead of agreeing with Donald Trump, we should be copying him. As he divorces, his, as he divorces himself from the prison of two ideas, we should too. Now, it's an interesting sentiment, right? Like it's this weird little nugget of truth buried in the otherwise kind of meaningless crevasses of Fox News. Trump is being presented as some kind of like right-wing deconstructionist messiah. His flexibility, his superficiality, they grant him a kind of freedom and flexibility that, according to Heap of Guts, other politicians don't really have. And I think he's right gut field. I think he's right. Like, I think that Trump does have a level of flexibility that most other political operators don't have. Like, what was that awesome video from his election? Despite its impressive length, it's a nimble navigator, and some can be highly venomous. So Trump's postmodernism is an asset for him. He uses the postmodern trends that are becoming more and more popular in the modern world to his advantage. He didn't invent these trends. He's much too stupid for that, right? But he is able to observe them happening and then use them to his advantage. And we'll talk about specific instances of that very soon. <laughs> Literally speaking, Trump is not a deconstructionist philosopher, obviously. Before he was a president, he was a public figure. He was a brand. He was a superficial presentation. And I mean, I keep saying this in videos over and over again, so I'm sure by now you're getting tired of hearing it, but that's all any of us are. All the self is, is this like superficial veneer uh, presentation. There's no depth of meaning to any of us. So the fact that Trump uh, is this presentational kind of self, this branded self, I don't think that makes him less authentic. Uh, it just makes him more overtly presentational. Whereas most of us present ourselves as authentic, most celebrities, most public figures, they don't have to do that. They, they're overtly a presentation and that kind of becomes who they are um, outside of like presentational modes, like off camera, I think these branded selves kind of retain that superficial presentationality. So like I said, most of us present ourselves as authentic. Trump is not limited in that way. He's free to present himself in any way that is to his advantage. So Blanchot says that the chief must prove his dominion over words. Silence is forbidden to him. Yet, it is not required that anyone listen to him. Indeed, no one pays attention to the chief's words, or rather, all feign inattention. And he, in fact, says nothing, but repeats the celebration of the traditional norms of life. To what requirement of society does this empty language which emanates from the apparent locus of power answer. So it's a really good question, right? Like what, what does Trump fulfill in society with his like empty, meaningless, truthfulness, truthlessness speech? How does his performance of authority and presidentiality help culture? It must be doing something or else it wouldn't be so well accepted by such a large portion of the population. People don't listen to Trump, just like Blanchot said. They feign inattention to him. He isn't received as firm and stable and meaningful. He's received presentationally. Like you can just look at how his supporters say things like, 
you can't listen to what he says. You have to listen to what he means. Like there's there there's there's a real understanding among Trump supporters uh, that you can't take him literally. That you have to kind of look at him presentationally and look at him moment to moment and take him kind of thematically or characteristically as opposed to verbally and literally. I mean, just look at how Gutfield talks about him, right? Like he's this, he's not someone who we should listen to. He's someone who we should emulate. So what's he doing for society? Well, I think the simple answer is nothing. He's a billionaire parasite and we should shake him off like the rodent that he is. But um, I don't think that's true. I think there is something kind of uh, adaptive or useful about Trump and people like Trump, uh, again, or else they wouldn't be so popular. Blanchot says the discourse of the chief is empty precisely because he is separate from power. It is society itself, which is the locus of power. The chief must move in the element of the word, which is to say, at the opposite pole from violence. It sounds like Blanchot is saying that the chief's language is non-violent, which certainly seems to run counter to Trump's language, which is insanely violent. But let's put that aside for a second and, and consider, you know, other interpretations of what Blanchot is saying here. Really, what he's saying is that the chief acts through speech, but doesn't act without speech. So, in a way, the chief doesn't act at all. He's this like static, stable entity, and um, he speaks instead of acting. Others act on his behalf. And this is literally true of presidents. Like you often hear that once they get out of office, like once they retire or whatever, they have to like get their driver's licenses again because for the duration of their uh, presidency, like I don't think think they're even allowed to drive. So again, like the role of the president is very symbolic. It's very kind of stand in e. They speak and others act. It's not really about what they do. They're a figurehead. So that's that's an aside. I'm sorry, that's not really what we're talking about here. So let's try to remember that Blanchot is writing a book about the disaster of writing. Speech in Blanchot's model is seen as traditional and stable and kind of represents the status quo. And writing is seen as this like subtly dangerous, repetitively disastrous force that undermines the stability and authority of speech. Now, Blanchot's whole project is to explore the violence of writing, to explore how writing undermines originality and always already kind of makes authenticity and truth impossible, which is why the, um, the chief's language is nonviolent in this context. The, the, the chief represents stability and status quo, whereas writing represents the chaos of undermining the status quo undermining the authority of kingly, sovereignly, chiefly speech. But, I mean, I'm sure this isn't a surprise, uh, he undermines this dichotomy. Blanchot, like so many other post-structural or proto-post-structural writers, doesn't like the idea of clearly divided dichotomies. And really, he doesn't let this dichotomy of non-violent speech violent writing exists for very long. In fact, <clears throat> in fact, in the next sentence, he undermines it when he says, the chief's obligation to speak, that constant flow of empty speech, not empty, but traditional, sheer transmission, which he owes to the tribe, is the infinite debt, which effectively rules out speaking man's ever becoming a man of power. So the speaking man, the chief, the ruler of the tribe, can never become a man of power. But the chief is in charge. So what's up with that? Well, like I said, this is Blachot contaminating that dichotomy. If speech is powerful, but if violence is power, 
and speech is nonviolent and writing is violent and writing is powerful, then nothing makes sense anymore. Everything is contaminated and mixed up and we can't clearly define any of these things, any of these concepts, violence, writing, speech, peacefulness. They're all just a gray mass. So speech is traditionally seen as the locus of power and originality and authenticity. But in the model Blanchot is presenting us, something very different is happening. We can see that speech is really passive, and it's the actions that follow speech that have power. Actions like violence or actions like writing. So to get back to Trump, his superficiality affords him a level of flexibility, and I've said this before, so I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but it affords him a level of flexibility that most people who cling to meta narratives like truth or justice just don't have. Like the fact that words like truth and justice mean nothing to a man like Trump are a huge advantage for him. Now, you could say that that's just a fancy way of saying that Trump is a liar, and I don't think you'd necessarily be wrong, but I think it's a little more complicated than that. A lie is defined by an absence. It's a, it's a kind of counter-identification. We can say what a lie isn't, it's not truthful, but we can't really say what a lie is. And this counter-identificationality I think doesn't really work when we're talking about Trump. Trump isn't telling us something that he knows to be false. He's presenting a reality as if it was true. And this is a superficial presentation. Like, it's not like a conspiracy theory where, you know, he's trying to develop, like, layers of evidence to fool researchers, and he's trying to concoct the kind of appearance of depth. No, what Trump is doing is just throwing words at a screen and knowing that people will believe them for at least as long as he says them. And then once he's off screen, it doesn't really matter what people think because it will be hit in the past and in the postmodern kind of condition. We just live in this rolling eternal present. We don't have any relationship to the past. So Trump can lie as much as he wants, and it really doesn't matter, because especially during the COVID crisis, things are moving so quickly that what he said a week ago is irrelevant, whether or not it was a lie. So Trump is super superficial. People joke about it all the time. Where do you go within you? What is it that you dig deep for to come up with a decision? Where do you go within you? There is no deep within him. He's so shallow, he barely exists in the third dimension. If you dumped a teaspoon of water in a kiddie pool, it would be deeper than Trump. There's nothing inside. He's as hollow as a chocolate Easter bunny. He's everyone in the Wizard of Oz in one package. What do I want? Brain, heart, courage, you name it. Oh, who am I? You can call me Tin Crow Lion. And this is distinct from how politicians usually lie. This isn't like the Soviets saying they invented the airplane and then producing fake documents to back that up. Like, this is literally just a word or two that he says, usually like denying something that he did in the past, right? So like, why didn't you do anything about the COVID crisis for the month of February? Why did we lock down in March and not February? Oh, I did lots during February, is Trump's reply. And that really makes it true. Just saying it is enough to make it true because no one holds his feet to the fire. The conversation just moves forward. The other day uh, on Hard Lens Media, which is a really, really fantastic uh, leftist kind of newsy channel. I like them. They're fun to watch. Uh, One of the guys on that channel made a really great point the other day that what's happening at these Trump press conferences is like a WWE match. Like, like the reporters and Trump both know that people are watching it for their fights, and they don't want to resolve any of their fights. They want to draw them out, just like a wrestling match. The goal isn't to win. The goal is to entertain the crowd and to make money off their attention. And that is exactly what's happening in these, um, these press conferences. 
and you didn't use it to prepare hospitals. You didn't use it to ramp up testing. Right you're now, so, you're so, you're so disgraceful. It's so disgraceful the way you said it. Let, let me just listen. Dead. I just How went so over it. I just went over it. Nobody thought we should do it. And when I did it. But what did you do with the time that you bought? You know the we month did? of February. That, you that know what we did? Gap. What do you do? What do you do when you have no case in the whole United States? You had cases when in you, you excuse me, you reported it. Zero cases, zero deaths on January seventeenth. January. February. The entire January. February. I said in January. Your video has a complete gap. On month January thirty. What did your administration do in February with the time that your travel ban bought? A lot. You? A lot. And in fact, we'll give you a so I know I just said that we live in this eternal rolling postmodern present, but bear with me for a second while we go back in time to 2004, which I know seems like a lifetime ago. On October 9th, 2004, Jacques Derrida died during surgery. He'd been battling pancreatic cancer for a year, and uh, you know, he didn't make it. He was an old man. It's a shame. In fact, his wife interestingly, died of COVID like a month ago. So, oh, also very sad. I think she was a French psychoanalyst. Um, so October 9th, Derrida dies. Now, on October 17th, as if possessed by Derrida's spirit, Karl Rove says, we're an empire now. And when we act, we create our reality while and while you're studying that reality judiciously as you will we'll act again creating another new reality which you can study too and that's how things will sort out we're history's actors and you all of you will be left just to study what we do now, the invasion of Iraq was supported by evidence, but it was very, very flimsy evidence, right? Like it was just enough to get the U.S. into the country, and then they really disregarded the weapons of mass destruction basically immediately. And what drove the U.S. to war in Iraq, right? It was a couple of grainy pitchers, a vial of baking soda in Colin Powell's hands. Like, we forgot about it basically immediately. So you could say that the invasion of Iraq was kind of the birth of Trumpism, although I don't really like the idea of labeling this brand of like discourse-focused political argumentation Trumpism, because he didn't invent it. Like I said, he's just really good at it. So, I mean, let's just get back to the, 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 you know, the vial of baking soda and the grainy photos. This evidence wasn't meant to sustain like a long, like a prolonged, in-depth look. The idea was to justify very, very quickly starting a war that, you know, would, would take like, what, like 13, 15 years to resolve. And I think the people who perpetrated that war knew that the evidence didn't have to be very strong. It just had to hold up for a few months while, uh, you know, the war got started. No, really, if we're not in our mop suits, that means there's no WMDs. If there's no WMDs, then why are we here in the first place? I knew you were a fucking gay ass liberal. You tried to pretend by invading Iraq with us, but I knew. These were presentational lies. They were deflections. They were, you know, veneers. There wasn't any attempt at depth because it wasn't necessary because there's no history anymore. So how does all of this make Trump a deconstructionist? Earlier in the series, I defined deconstruction as a process of taking something apart from inside that thing. It's like a disassembly of using words and tools provided by the subject of your disassembly. Now, Trump is doing this. He's working from inside the political system to take it apart, to, to change what truth is and what meaning is and what evidence is and what the president's role in American politics is. He's a disruptive, destructive force. He's replacing the complex, developmental, uh, <clears throat> faux, deep, like fake, deep, they give the appearance of depth, is what I mean, 
arguments that politicians usually use. The way that politicians usually lie is complicated. It's meant to obfuscate investigation. That is not what Trump does. He's completely upfront about what he lies about. Just look at how he talks about election reform as a result of COVID. Mailing mail-in ballots for voting. I think mail-in voting, voting, voting is but horrible. You voted by it's mail corrupt. in Florida's election last month, didn't you? Sure, I, I could vote by mail for the, How do you reconcile Because that? I'm allowed to. This blatant superficiality is how he uses deconstruction, but I really think that's what he does more than practices deconstruction. Like, I think it's kind of, it would be kind of weird to call him a French philosopher, a a deconstructionist. I think to call Trump a deconstructionist would be like to call Alexander the Great an Aristotelian. Just because Aristotle taught Alexander the Great doesn't mean that Alexander the Great was Aristotelian. He was a thug who was taught by a philosopher. And that's exactly what Trump is. Trump is applying the principles of postmodernism and deconstruction to achieve his goals, which at this point, it's really hard for me to determine whether or not Trump wants money or fame. Uh, I think he might like attention more than money. As the New York Times said, we have Monday night football type ratings, but even they said that the ratings are like Monday night football ratings and that these are like bachelor finale that's their end when the big deal happened i have no idea what happened because i'm too busy working on this somebody will tell me what happened and i think this obsession with fame is really emblematic of trump's use of postmodernism. fame is like i said at the beginning of this video it's a veneer public figures public brands branded individuals their their superficial presentations of a self which is all any of us are to be you know to beat a dead horse um, but, uh, but Trump uses the superficiality of the famous identity in, in the political sphere better than anyone I've ever seen. Because the truth is all any politician can offer their supporters is a superficial presentation, is a veneer, a, a surface, but, but, but they can't admit that to themselves. Whereas Trump, he just skims along the surface like a water bug. It's crazy. I'm not done talking about COVID and the alt-right and Trumpism and stuff like that, but I am going to take a break from it for a little while. Uh, A few nights ago, I watched a movie called Platform, which you should all watch, not just because it's a good movie, but also because my next video is going to be on it. Um, I think it's a really good subject uh, to talk about allegory uh, with, and um, between you and me, I don't really know that much about allegory. I know Walter Benjamin um, has some really good, uh, or people say it's really good, theory on allegory. I've never read it. I've read about it. So I'm going to spend the next little while reading Walter Benjamin's uh, theory of allegory, which I believe appears in his like German tragedy book. I don't know. I haven't read that much Walter Benjamin. So anyway, that's what I'm going to be doing for the next week or so. Uh, And um, hopefully in the near future, you guys are going to get a video on the platform, which is on Netflix, and you should go watch it. And uh, Walter Benjamin's Theory of Allegory. Uh, That's it for this week. Uh, Thanks for watching The Theory Creep. I'm The Theory Creep. This is The Theory Creep. Have yourselves a good lockdown.